Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure all of you are getting a bit exhausted and probably numb with all this information. So I'll try and keep it a little bit light um, and show you a couple of new therapies for chronic bronchitis. So these are my disclosures, and relevant to this is really that I've been, the clinical hospitals have been reimbursed for the clinical trials. So as we saw recently, just with the previous speaker, the epithelium plays a very vital role in these uh, conditions. And in chronic bronchitis, the epithelium is exposed to cigarette smoke, air pollution, and the net effect of this is the release of a number of cytokines and stimulation of mucus production. And this, in turn, is a kind of feedback mechanism which leads to the features of chronic bronchitis. Now, one possible treatment is actually the use of liquid nitrogen cryospray. So this is not nitrous oxide, but liquid nitrogen. So it flash freezes the epithelium to minus 196 degrees centigrade. And with regards to the cryospray, it ablates the epithelium down to a depth of around 0.5 millimeters. So essentially, you're targeting the tissue right down to the submucosa, uh, destroying the epithelium, submucosal glands, and some of the cartilaginous structures, and possibly some neuronal structures. But at the same time, making sure that we don't uh, disrupt any of the cartilage. <clears throat> so this is a procedure, and you can see the flash freeze that occurs with the liquid nitrogen. And once the uh, treatment's been delivered, you then move on more proximally within the airways. So there have been a number of studies already conducted. The first one was an initial safety study where we treated patients with lung cancer who were undergoing a resection, treated them with cryospray, and they underwent immediate resection. The second study, there was a delay of two days to 14 days before the resection. So we could really try and get a handle of the natural history of the pathological effects of cryospray. And then we went on to perform a feasibility study in 35 patients over uh, three treatments. In that study, eight patients were first treated. We waited for them to complete treatment. And once we knew that it was safe, proceeded to complete the study. And more recently, over the COVID period, we managed to complete a randomized sham control study with metered cryospray, really studying the mechanisms of action in a lot more detail. So essentially, the treatment is delivered from the, the segments, usually level five, more proximally up to the trachea. And you can see, obviously, the airway anatomy is different. And therefore, the dose is according to the size of the airway. So the dose delivered to the segmental anatomy will be different to the dose delivered to the trachea. And also, the, we have a different algorithm for females compared to males due to the size differences. And that's very important because, obviously, liquid nitrogen expands to seven times its volume. So we need to make sure that the dosing is very accurate and also that there is egress or escape of that uh, gas formation from the airways. Um, otherwise, you're going to get issues of barotrauma, such as pneumothoraces and mediastinal uh, um, emphysema. So this is the results for the feasibility study. And you can see that all of these patients have moderate to severe uh, um, airflow obstruction. I'll just go back. Um, they all had quite symptomatic disease with a CAT score of more than 20 and an SGRQ score of close to 60. So they're very symptomatic patients with moderate airflow obstruction. And these were the safety results. And on the whole, you can see that they're the kind of expected uh, adverse events which we'd expect from bronchoscopy in patients with moderate COPD, i.e. exacerbations of airways diseases and exacerbations of COPD. Uh, there were only uh, 14 serious adverse events. Most of them were not really very severe and required any hospitalization for a day, and then the patients were discharged home with no issues. So what we showed was that it was relatively safe. More importantly, there were no pneumothoraces and no pneumomedistinum. And in terms of feasibility, you can see that the doses were all effectively administered, and there was only 86% um, of the full dose was delivered in the majority of patients. And these are the results of the feasibility study, and you can see that they're clinically meaningful improvements 
in quality of life parameters, but I have to remember, remind you to just take this information with a pinch of salt because obviously this is an open label feasibility study. So the primary aim is to evaluate safety, but this also gives us some information on a signal whether it is effective or not. These are the changes in the cough scores and the CAT scores, and once again you can see a signal there, but the numbers in the study are really small, and it's not really designed to look at that in more detail. We then went on to conduct a randomized sham controlled study. Now that design is far more important because it really makes sure that when you're looking at patient reported outcomes that they're blinded. But also we looked at in this study to do a lot of molecular work. We did single cell sequencing and gun biopsies. We've done histopathology and a lot of the um, um, molecular data and the histochemical data is still pending. But the clinical data thus far is shown on this. This is the baseline demographics, and you can see most of these patients have smoked quite heavily. Again, they have very symptomatic with SGRQ scores around 60, CAT scores are over 20, but they don't really have that much impact on lung function relative to their symptoms. And these are the uh, results. Again, you can see that we managed to give 85% of the treatments in total that we intended to. Uh, the procedure lasted about uh, 45 to 58 minutes, and you can see that there's a clinically meaningful improvement in the SGRQ scores. And if I show you that in a graphical format, what we demonstrate here is that in the sham group, the symptom scores all go down, um, so they all remain unchanged or go up, whereas in the treatment group, there's an improvement in these symptom scores. There's very little improvement in the activity scores, because remember, again, it's not the activity that's affected, it's the symptoms and quality of life. So what we've got so far is that uh, liquid nitrogen cryospray treatment, the rejuvenate therapy, appears to be safe, it appears to be feasible. There is a signal of efficacy, but actual efficacy is currently being evaluated in a large-scale multinational randomized controlled study and hopefully we'll get some data over the next uh, 24 months. I'd now really like to turn my attention to another method for achieving the same thing. So once again, what you're trying to do is to ablate the epithelium, and in this case, we used um, electrical pulsed wave energy to achieve this. So as most of the people in this room like doing, we perform a bronchoscopy, and then insert a catheter into the area that we're gonna treat them, you expand this wire basket and then apply this pulsed electrical field energy which is timed in sequence with the QRS complex. And what basically happens is you get ionic shifts within the cells causing cell lysis, but the actual extracellular matrix is preserved. And this allows the mesenchymal stem cells to repopulate more effectively, leading to restoration of the normal epithelium. And what we hope is that the normal ciliary function is re-established and you've got less goblet cells, less submucosal glands, and potentially what we also say in the pathology specimens is less smooth muscle uh, and inflammatory changes. And here you've got a specimen which shows you at baseline. We've got squamous metaplasia, goblet cell hyperplasia. After treatment, a 24 hours complete ablation of the epithelium. And usually within seven days, you've got re-epithelialization and less goblet cells in the, that area. So here's a video of the procedure. This is one of the procedures we performed a few weeks ago. And essentially you um, go down to the small airways around uh, uh, three millimeter size airways. You expand this uh, wire basket. Once you've got full uh, expansion, you apply the energy and then you move proximately, treating all the various subsegments and moving proximally right up to the right main bronchus, and if you're treating the left side, up to the left main bronchus. So it's a sequential procedure, very similar to bronchial thermoplasty, uh, but with some subtle uh, differences. The basket and everything is much longer, there's a much more closer electrical connection with the mesh, um, and also, therefore, uh, you're, you're getting a very more continuous treatment than with bronchial thermoplasty. And these are the results of several studies that were performed. The first column shows the results that were performed in Europe. Um, 
uh, Australia and South America. The second one is a Canadian study, and the third one was a, a US feasibility study. And once again, you can see that the patient demographics, that these patients had a lot of symptoms, high SGRQ score, high CAT score, high cough score. So very symptomatic patients. And the results really show that once again, they're relatively safe with no major issues. These are the pathological findings, which are very interesting. And you can see that the amount of goblet cell hyperplasia is reduced post-treatment and appears to be maintained up to a four-month period. This is even more fascinating, because here you have a CT scan performed at inspiration and expiration at baseline and following treatment. And you can see, actually, that the airway volume after treatment is much larger. So why does that happen? And it's probably a combination of effects in the terms of reduction of mucus plugging, but possibly that smooth muscle ablation that also accompanies this may lead to a little bit of bronchodilatation. And what the net effect is a 20% improvement in airway volume. Quite remarkable improvements in SGRQ. I'm not sure I believe this incredible improvement. And I think we should all be a little bit hesitant and uh, skeptical because this is an open label study, but the, um, all the data seems to be going in the same direction. Improvements in SGRQ, as I've shown you, improvements in the CAT scores, and improvements in the symptom scores with SGRQ. So signals in three different clinical trials all going the same way, and really looking forward to the results of the pivotal randomized sham control study that we're conducting at the moment. So again, these results should be available in the next 18 months. So this again just reinforces the data seems to uh, be very stable. You've got static changes up to two years out now. And more importantly, what we're seeing here is a reduction in exacerbation rate. A lot of the data from the past shows that these mucus hypersecretors are the ones who get the greatest decline in lung function. They also have the greatest morbidity and mortality and exacerbation rates. And what we're seeing is a signal towards improvements in exacerbations following treatment. And this is just one of the slides which shows it quite elegantly. The right side was treated. When we came to do the second bronchoscopy, you could see the left side was full of mucus, but the right side is still pretty clear. The finally, I'm going to finish on targeted lung denervation. So the vagus nerve, we all know, mediates bronchospasm, but also mucus secretion. So if you ablate the vagus nerve, potentially we will get some improvements in cough and sputum production. And this is uh, the Nuvera system for targeting lung denervation, which essentially works by expanding the balloon uh, to the airway. The balloon cools the mucosa, and therefore the radio frequency energy is actually delivered about eight millimeters outside that area, which happens to be where you have the nerves running on the airway. And basically you treat a 90 degree quadrant, you then rotate, treat the next 90 degrees, and so forth. There are some subtleties with this procedure. For example, if you end up treating the esophageal nerve, because that plexus can be close in some patients, then they get side effects of gastroplexy and gastroparesis. So it's very important that we measure the distance of the esophagus to where we're treating, but also we use cooling balloons in the esophagus and various subtleties uh, to do this. And this procedure is done under fluoroscopy to maximize the positioning of the electrode against the uh, um, airway to try and make sure that we are ablating correctly. These are the results from Airflow 2. This was a randomized sham control study. And what you can see is there's a quite remarkable reduction in a number of symptoms, which include cough, dyspnea, bronchitis, but also, very importantly, reductions in the exacerbation rates. You can see improvements in quality of life, particularly uh, SGRQ symptom scores. And then, once again, we are getting that signal of a reduction in exacerbation rates. So all of these pro therapies look extremely promising. And I think in the next two years, you're going to see a lot of action on uh, chronic bronchitis. Cryospray, lung denervation, rheoplasty, and remember, Prevalence of chronic bronchitis is way over 10% in the population. So this is a therapy that's applicable to a large population of patients. Thank you, and I'll stop there.